And I, I just thought it, it's a huge like part of the fire service that the volunteer side was missing was this, you know, we're, we're training the members, but nobody's training us. Response is engine five, engine three, engine one, ladder three, ladder two, rescue one. We've got smoke showing. Division one, you're on location, block 23, reporting smoke showing 727. All right. Welcome back, everyone, uh, to Job Talk Season 3. Uh, we're missing Will today. He's out and about in the universe. Uh, but we have a very special guest, uh, Chief David Lenart. Um, he's going to talk with us about um, volunteer fire officers, specifically uh, volunteer fire service development. Um, but as always, um, we're happy to have everyone that's tuning in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, so, Dave, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so how I just give everyone a backstory. So how I initially found you. So you have your own, uh, Instagram page called the volley chief. Um, I've been following, I've been following you for a while. You have some really good content uh, and stories regarding, um, kind of volunteer fire officer culture, volunteer culture. And I feel like as not particularly Massachusetts, but as you get down towards like Southern Connecticut and Connecticut, that's where volunteer culture really starts to, to take off. Yeah. Our, uh, you know, we have like a unique history here, the, the volunteers. It kind of, it, it kept up as everything evolved as as career departments, call departments, things like that started evolving. The, the volunteer system, you know, Connecticut along the shoreline, you know, then you start moving down to, the, to New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. It, it's still a very strong juggernaut, even, you know, politically, the part of the machine that the, the small towns run off of is still entwined in the volunteer fire department. So just an interesting little, I guess you'd say area. Yeah. So as far as I guess, we'll, uh, we'll start with your background, right? So you've been, you've been a volunteer, you've been in the fire service for over 20, 26 years, I think, right? Um, yeah. Years. So I, I, so we actually joined, uh, it, it was weird, you know, different worlds back then, but under the civil defense rules, uh, they had, you know, with the auxiliary firefighters and it was, you know, so when the Russians nuked us, uh, <laughs> We they, you had more firemen, <laughs> and uh, it allowed us to go to fires at 15. So that was the thing was you wow. were allowed at, at 15 years old to to be firefighter. So yeah. uh, I I joined you know end of '93 early '94. We went through a 40 hour basic firefighter course, and we were firefighters. And it it was it was just incredible because nowadays the thought of putting a 15 year old kid into a burning building is is insane and back then yeah. it was the normal yeah that's cool with the uh the civil defense it's like the only thing that will survive the nuclear holocaust are cockroaches and firemen <laughs> yeah you know like we <laughs> it's funny because we had like a civil defense office and it had like drums of drinking water you know yeah. like the uh the, all the radiation equipment that was in there and uh wow. you know but it was also for us too it was family so, yeah. uh, you know, my lineage goes well back over a century, even in the same volunteer fire company. My, you know, my great grandfather was fire chief 100 years ago. Wow. And then my grandfather, it, it transferred down to my father, you know, brothers, cousins, uncles. Uh, there, there's a lot of us. And, and it's in still in that same, you know, volunteer firehouse. It's the, the storm engine company, too. It was founded in 1851. And my family landed there right around uh, 1908, 1909. So we, we've been consistent since then. So you guys could have been in like the gangs in New York movie. You guys yeah, might have yeah, had a almost, fire company uh, out there. You know, <laughs> it's funny, you know, like I'm not the first fire chief in my family that had to deal with a pandemic. Uh, you know, my great grandfather was chief during the Spanish flu. So, uh, you know, I think about, you know, fortunately we were, uh, he, he lived almost to be a hundred. So I, I, you know, remember him. I said, God, I probably could ask him a couple of questions. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. But uh, it, it, you know, it was an interesting thing. And my, my grandfather, uh, he, he was kind of the, the well-known one. He, um, in our area, he was very well known. He was a news reporter, uh, a news photographer, reporter for the local paper. And, and for those of you unfamiliar with Connecticut, I should probably back up a little bit, but we're from an area called the Valley. It's where the Housatonic and the Naugatuck rivers meet. 
Uh, the, the city of Derby is, you know, it's a thriving metropolis of five square miles. The population's <laughs> about, uh, about 15,000 people, but the, a third of the city is a state park. So you've got 15,000 people living in just over three square miles. So it, it's, it's a little city. That's cool. And then yeah. it's bordered by Ansonia, Shelton, and Seymour, which are, you know, world New, New England mill towns. The downtown areas are that dense multifamily, you know, old factories now converted to, to uh, you know, to, to apartments and, and commercial buildings. Uh, so that, that's the area. We call it the Valley. But uh, he, he worked for the local newspaper that covered the Valley, and he covered uh, fire and emergencies. So growing up as kids, you wanted to, to sleep at Paz because he was going to a fire somewhere at night. And a lot of times he would pull up, take the picture, and then put the camera on the seat in the car, grab his gear, you know, or, or simultaneously taking pictures while, you know, fighting the fire. Uh, and that's where kind of he got his start. And then it elevated when the war broke out because when he went, his basic training was at Newport Naval Station. And when he got there, they found out that he was a firefighter. So they put him in the base fire department. And, you know, opportunities came and he ended up teaching shipboard firefighting. So when the war ended and he came back, you know, home, uh, they asked him to to be fire chief in town because he just had all this experience doing shipboard firefighting in the Navy. And as we know, the Navy's usually cutting edge firefighting technology. Uh, so he said, sure, you know, he'll do it. And uh, he became one of the fire chiefs in town. And he was very close. One of a couple of his friends from the Navy, one, you know, somewhere in New Haven Fire Department, somewhere in the Bridgeport Fire Department. And he kept those relationships up and he, he would, you know, became very well known in the state as an instructor. Uh, he, he, you know, he formed our regional fire school and uh, w was just, you know, well known. You know, he, uh, I actually found the newspaper article. It was from January of 1947. He bought our first wow. Scott Air Packs. Wow. You know, so he, he was well ahead of technology yeah. uh, back then. And, and again, being in the Navy, you know, he used to always say in the Navy, you got to be good firemen or good swimmers. Because if you're yeah. if you're not good fireman, you better be a good swimmer. <laughs> so well, yeah, uh, I had never even really thought. So like as you're you know you're mentioning the air packs, like obviously in that era, like no one was really wearing them. But I think like if you think about a ship, like there's really nowhere for that smoke, those products of combustion to go. So you you have to, yeah you have to wear it. Uh, it's actually it's funny because I'm about to start writing about. We still use the navy nozzles for car fires. In, in Derby at, at, at my files the storms uh, with the low velocity fog applicator. And I laugh because it's such old technology now, but if you watch guys try to put out a car fire, you know, they're trying to cut the hood. They're trying to, and it, it, it always, it never looks pretty putting out a car fire, but yeah. with the old Navy nozzles, you could, you could put out a fully involved car fire, the engine compartment, the, the passenger compartment with less than half a tank of water. And it, it's just, you know, you have the, the uh, low velocity fog applicator with the six, it's a six foot gooseneck for, uh, for if you've never seen it, you could just no. walk up and stick it under the car and you don't even need to cut the hood. It, you know, you're in the engine compartment, just stick it in there. And then, wow. it, it, you know, it, it is one of those things that it's old technology, but it, it, it still works and kind of everyone threw them out or now they use them as like a mantle piece. Um, yeah, it still works, still relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, we had those and then my, my father, it's funny cause my father's actually, uh, I, I don't know the proper term, but he married into it. So my my grandfather, you know, my my mother is is the connection. And then my father was recruited to play softball for the fire department. And then he met my mother, but obviously got yeah. interested in, in the firefighting side of it. Yeah. So, you know, from a young age, like we were lucky. We never worried what we were going to be when we grow up. We, we knew yeah. we wanted to be firefighters and we couldn't yeah. wait. You know, we grew up in that firefighting culture. My uh, again, my grandfather ran the regional fire school, so we spent our weekends with him at the yeah. fire school. You know, they were always burning. They were always doing something. Was, so, was that fire it, school? Was that just like, a, was that regional or was that kind of through this? I, uh, sure it, it was that. originally, it was this, it was ours. It was the Derby fire school. And then he, as, as regionalization started, it morphed into a regional fire school. And yeah. it is, it's currently, you know, it's currently the Valley Regional Fire Training School. Uh, the, their their location has changed. Originally, they were right where the two rivers met, but they turned that all into a park now. Uh, yeah. So that it's the you know the original school's not there, but yeah, the school still you know lives on as our regional fire school. It's incredible. Yeah, I try and we try and place a lot of emphasis on obviously on the show. We try and interview people from all different walks of life, and you're 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 very cool. One, we appreciate like you got you have your own social media presence and trying to be you know progressive and engaging the fire service community. 
um, but kind of walking both hats of being on on Bridgeport and then also in the fire uh, in the volunteer fire service. I I think I told you I started as as a call member in Munson, so I try and always capture as much as that as possible. But when I was sixteen, like uh, as we called them auxiliary members, um, you couldn't go. You could only do like exterior fighting firefighting operations. Um, but I remember like you back then. I mean, I'm not that old, obviously, but like um, we still <laughs> we still had the uh, the audible siren. On if you heard yes, that, you we could we down. it's actually it's kind of funny. We just got rid of ours a couple of years ago, and uh, nah. you know we still had the pull boxes and the game well system in town. And, and you know when a box came in, it was either transmitted from the outside or the inside, and, and yeah, you would hear when the when the, the you know coming over the pager when the tone would go in, you'd listen for the beep in the background of the yeah. uh, I forgot the name of the the, uh, the encoder. You'd listen for the beep, then you knew that the they were putting a box in, so yeah. like that they, they were getting multiple calls. It sounded good. Uh, but yeah, we and then we laughed because we we went back and looked, and it had been well over a decade. And the only boxes that had been pulled that were for calls were uh, there was two firehouses in town. That one of them's in the middle of the downtown area, right on uh, State Road where they meet. So that one had been pulled twice for uh, car accidents in front of the firehouse. And then the, there was a box that's across the street from elementary school that has playing fields. And that one had been pulled like two or three times for medical emergencies. So we went to the city and we were like, Hey, look, our, you know, the budget's like 20 grand. We could get rid of the boxes, decommission the system, and then we'll use the money for the fire department. So that night the city approved it. And about three hours later, somebody ran out of their house because it was on fire. Didn't have a cell phone, saw the box and pulled the box. And I was like, are are, you know, you, you can't script it. Uh, but we, we ended up getting rid of it. This, the system's mothballed, but, uh, you know, each of the firehouses, we kind of, we had to register the bells in the boxes still. So we, we, you know, we're in the, they, they were in the process of setting up. So each firehouse at least had an, a system still, and you could, you know, for nostalgia, pull the box and, and ding the bell. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, very similar. When I, I think it was about the year I was graduating high school, they de- decommissioned the system and they let us each um, take one of the old, the old Gamwell boxes. So I have the box yep. uh, from our street. It was in, like back in the day, like you said, like they had, someone had to run, they knew where their nearest box was. They had to run down the street and pull the box. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, again, it was, I, I we first joined the mid nineties. We were still three quarter boots, long coats, you know, in the winter you brought the rubber coat out. Uh, you know, it, it was still, I guess you could say that we, I caught the end of the fun times. Yeah. You know, it, it was, uh, it was, yeah, we, we got, we got turnout gear in Derby. I want to say around 97, 98 is when they, they, they made the transition to everybody having to have it. And, yeah. uh, and it was one of those, it was forced by OSHA. We weren't, it wasn't like our choice. You know, like the, the yeah. somebody made a complaint to OSHA about the gear and they yeah. came down and finally said, okay, you gotta, you know, you gotta do it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard other people oh, yeah. call that era the end of the fun times also. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah working it just, with some of the older guys. They, yeah, but they it was, uh, you know, Derby, it's it's small. So the, the department itself, theoretically on paper, there's 300 members. Um, you know, it's authorized 300 members, 75 per company. There's four companies. And um, they, realistically, there's around 100 that are actually active. And less than that, you know, even to to – complete your certifications and to keep your recertifications, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, you know, cause the, the downside, I hate to say one of the things that worried me uh, is that you could have people that just show up, you know, they're, they're on paper, they're a member, they don't, you know, they, they, they didn't really contribute much, but there's a fire a block from their house and they're going to be there. And it's mm-hmm. like, you're like, Oh my God, they're so, you know, obviously we instituted some, some rules of, of recertification and the number of, amount of training you had to attend to be considered, you know, interior, Right. And uh, and it, it, it kind of it, it helped us a lot with with controlling the membership and, and, you know, ensuring the guys that really needed the gear, the active members that were doing stuff, got the equipment. Right. Uh, it, you know, and that kind of stuff. So sounds like an accountability things, nightmare. Yeah, it was a little bit. First of all, accountability for volunteer fire departments is difficult. Uh, of course. You know, that's a whole nother topic of conversation. We uh, in Derby, you know, there's different systems. A lot of people use like a tag system or. or we use uh, called a T-Pass system, where it's actually each member is issued an RFID tag, and uh, this, this, it's Grace Industries is the name of the company. It's it's out of uh, they're out of Pennsylvania, but it, for volunteers, it's a great system. It's it's expensive. It's about a thousand dollars a member, 
wow. uh, to, to buy the unit and to keep the receiver going. But, you know, it's rough. I mean, there's times when you're pulling up to a fire and you're looking at trunks popped and sneakers on the ground and, and to try to, you know, get a picture of who's there. Sure. Who's there. Um, you know, versus at work when I go into the morning and I print out the roster and it tells me this, these are the 62 people and this is where they're riding and I fold it up and put it in my pocket and I've got it for the day. Right. So it's, yeah. it's, I hate to say the extreme of both worlds, but, uh, hmm. you know, so it with, is, it's, it's with Derby. Um, I, I, have a, I have a bunch of questions, but, um, <laughs> do you guys, so you guys are almost like, it's one fire department, but people are assigned to an individual company. Like you're assigned. Yeah. Assigned so there's the, the, there's four individual, the easiest way to equate it to paid guys is think that there's four separate house funds, <laughs> and, uh, right? Yeah. So you have your coffee yeah. club or your house fund. So yeah. uh, there's the four companies and the companies, most of uh, the two of the companies predate the fire department forming as one. And, um, you know, the Hotchkiss hose company, they're the second oldest continually operated firehouse they were formed in the 1830s, wow. and then the Storms was formed in 1851. So, the uh, and then the Pegasus came in in 1903 in the East End in uh, the 50s. So, another unique feature of our area is that the firehouses are usually named. Uh, and the sad part is some of the names have just been lost to history. You know, it's yeah. more myth of how the firehouse got named. Hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously, that for us, the Hotchkiss was named after the guy who founded it. Uh, the East End, they were in the East End of the city. Uh, the Pagassets, their firehouse is located where the Pagasset tribe had their, you know, their, their their houses and their home in their neighborhood. So that area, you know, their homage to the to the Indian tribe. Uh, the the storms. The explanation has always been that it was always just called Engine Two, and then uh, they had a fire, and the headline of the paper said Derby's new fire company puts up storm of water, and it kind of mm-hmm. became a nickname that they, you know, they were the storms guys, mm-hmm. and they yeah. just adopted it. Uh, so we have that. You know, Aunt Sonia has a neat one. Uh, the Eagle Hose, when they bought their first apparatus in the 1870s, they couldn't afford to change the name. It was used. So oh. they couldn't afford to change the name. And it was, you know, because back then they were all ornate, hand-painted, ornamental, yeah. mm-hmm. you know. And, it, and so they changed the name of the firehouse to the Eagles to match the truck they bought. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's it's around here. That's one of the things. They're all named. But the the four firehouses are independent organization. They elect their own officers. Uh, but they're subservient to the department. And each company has a, a chief that the chiefs are on the department level. Uh, another oddity is the chiefs are tested positions. So uh, we, we sit down and take, you know, take a test. They do it every two years. And that determines who the next, you know, assistant chief's going to be. Uh, and it's ministered by the State Fire Academy. So they, you know, we bring in an outside company to do the testing, which for a volunteer department, you know, is, is very rare. Uh, there's each company has a captain and two lieutenants. And those are elected. The, the requirements are you have to be a, a, a interior firefighter for five years and have a minimum of fire two to, okay. to take the to become an, an officer. So that's it. Are you guys somewhat unique for doing the state testing? Like, are there other volunteer fire departments? Yeah, we are for volunteers around us. Uh, most of the neighboring towns are either elected or appointed by like the mayor. So, hmm. do you? One of the things that. Um, we hear a lot and, you know, we've, we've gone out and interviewed one of my best friends. He's a chief of a combination department of Western Mass. Uh, and a lot, one of the things that we hear about a lot is the struggle for staffing. Do you, is that something? Cause oh. I mean, 300 members is, is phenomenal. Or yeah. A, un, unfortunately it's, it's absolutely, uh, you know, I forget who the author was that used to say it was, it was slowly then all at once. I forget who, 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 quote, yeah. who that, whose quote that is, but you know, it declined rapidly. I mean, when when I was young, when when in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, you could get a, a, a couple rooms going in a house and you never rolled mutual aid. You know, yeah. you 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 handled it yourself. You had plenty of members. Uh, you still had a lot of industry in the area. So a lot of guys still worked locally. And uh, it, it but it seems like in the past, I would say 10 years, it's it's fallen off a cliff. It's very common now for us to uh, interoperate with the neighboring departments, you know, first due, second due, you're pulling up. And and I think we've done a good job with the, the neighboring towns of, you know, Shelton and Sonia, uh, Chief Jones, Franny Jones from Shelton Fire. He's he's very forward thinking. And then uh, in Aunt Sonia, uh, Anthony DeLucia, I actually grew up next door to him. So it's kind of funny that we both, you know, we went this path. But uh, we uh, we always, we merged on 
operations, but not like officially where a lot of things. So if, if we get a fire in downtown Derby, you know, Shelton automatically, the, the closest firehouse in Shelton is, is right off our downtown. Uh, you know, they're automatically coming and we're automatically going there. Uh, in my tenure as chief, you know, we had a couple of fires in Ansonia where I was in command because they had no chiefs or uh, we got there, you know, quick enough that our guys were the, you know, the first line in and vice versa. Uh, yeah. So the, the staffing and the, the, the membership, it's it's a lot. It's a nationwide problem. And I don't see a solution. You know, the, yeah. the and I hate to say you hate to be one of those people like, oh, yeah, it's a problem. Mm-hmm. But I can't bring it, it's just the the investment. You know, you, you know, we could go all day down the road of paid volunteer fighting. You know, if you want to be a volunteer fireman, it, it is the same requirement. And and there's no, you know, nobody calls time out and says, oh, hold on. They're volunteers. So we're going to only give them like less of a fire. And the, yeah. the, you know, the requirement is still the same. The training is still the same. And, and that's where you you just lose people. You know, somebody comes into the firehouse and joins and says, hey, I, you know, I want to be a fireman, help the community. You're like, okay. Well, it, you know, over the next year, I need 200 hours from you. And, and you know, it, what? You know, yeah, just, no, no, I just, I just want to be a fireman. Yeah, that, that's, that's yeah. what we're, that's the basic. Right. You yeah. know, and it, you, you keep uh, your legacy members, kind of keep a couple, you know, guys coming. You, you still have members that have kids and their kids grow up and obviously in the firehouse. So they're going to join. Uh, fortunately for us, we're only a couple towns away from the University of New Haven. I was going to ask. They have a very strong, yeah, fire science program. So we've been able to um, snag a lot of members over the years that that we could use to to kind of fill a gap a little bit uh, from UNH. But then again, the summer comes and they all go home, uh, you know, or the holidays they all go home. But it's tough. We've done some things. We we instituted tax breaks, uh, you know, within the city where you get uh, you know money off your property taxes. Uh, when I left, my our legislator was working on some more incentives. I was working with them. Uh, we were talking about either like uh, state school, you know, tuition reimbursement or, or some programs like that that to try to retain those younger members. Um, yeah. You know, we do things like, uh, you know, the ambulance corps in town does like a pay call system where you get like a, a small, you know, 25 bucks a call, like reimbursement. Uh, yeah. Things along those lines. But it, um, it's just, you know. It's tough. It's a huge time commitment. Uh, f- another lucky thing we have here in the Valley is a lot of us went on to be career firemen. So, you know, I, I you know, I could tell you that we have a guy from my from the storms in every fire department from pretty much from Greenwich to East Haven, you know, the, the, the 15 towns along the coast of the, uh, Connecticut. So a lot of us went on to become vo- uh, from volunteers to career which means that, you know, we work 24 on 72 off. So we're around a lot during the day. Uh, the other advantage we have in, in Derby, it's kind of funny. Um, we have a family that the, 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 the Traz family, they own the, the local garage and they do heavy wrecking their, their, you know, truck mechanics, but the, the dad and the two sons, uh, they're, you know, very active in the department. And it's almost like you have like a, a staff company in the city because, Everybody working at the garage is is member of the volunteer fire department, and uh, you know when there's a, a box they leave. And, and our our truck, I, I I know when they listen to this they're going to cry, but they're technically a quint. You know they've yeah. got 300 <laughs> gallons of water with the pump. Um, and just the other day we had a room and content, and it was pretty much you know the the Tracy family, uh, the, you know the dad drove the two the uh, the, the two. Uh, boys were on the end. I hate to say Paul and boys because they're in their mid twenties now, and but they were kids. Like you know, you remember them as kids. Yeah. But they, uh, they, you know, they had the line. So it's like we we kind of luck out that we have between that and the the ambulance is is paid during the day, and uh, you know the ambulance carries you know two two packs a set of irons hook and can, and most of the members that work the ambulance are also uh, members of the fire department. So between them, you've got you know six seven members that are yeah. around during the day to get you started. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's ask pretty badass that. about that family. That's awesome. They are. I they're, love... they're, and they're tremendous. They're the greatest, like they're, they're the nicest people in the world. Uh, if you, if I called them right now and said, Hey, I'm broke down, you know, on the side of the road somewhere, they're in the car. Oh, I'd man. love to so roll up to a fire with my dad and my brothers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, know. it's, oh. you know, so it's, <laughs> it's funny. So awesome. I mean, it, it is, it is, uh, you know, we're lucky to have that. And, uh, yeah. they're, you know, yeah. And, and then you got the knowledge, the side too, that they're a heavy wrecking company. 
Yeah. So, you know, you get any, you know, we had a, a couple of years ago, we had 18 wheeler drive off the highway, hanging off the highway and they're showing yep. up with heavy wreckers. Right. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. They so, should, yeah. They should tech rescue. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah the start of it. Rescue. Yeah. We're, we're lucky that we have that. Uh, you know, we have a lot of that. We still have a lot of, you know, the strength of a volunteer department is the members in their, their side jobs. You know, uh, in my program, I have a picture, I call it the old guys, but you take, you know, it's a, a photo of, of the older, you know, 10 members from our department. And it's like one, one's a structural engineer. He's actually, uh, he's our fire commissioner right now, Gary Parker. He's a structural engineer with the mass uh, task force. He's, he's a USAR structural engineer. And then, you know, another guy's an iron worker, another guy's a machinist. Uh, you've got a couple of cops in the mix. You, so, you, you know, the background that the members bring it is such yeah. a strength, especially in a volunteer organization. Uh, you know, you got us that are just dumb firemen, but you got some good technical guys that, that, you know, know a lot about different assets that they could bring. And it's the same in the career department, right? Who's an electrician? Mm -hmm. Who's a, yeah. you know, who's the plumber? Who's the carpenter? So you use those guys. Uh, so, it, it, but it's a big asset in the volunteer department that you have these random members that, you know, that do this and you're, you, you find out, you know, you need someone even administratively. You know, over the years when it came to running websites or, or trying to, to create uh, data entry stuff. And one of the guys is an IT guy. You can call him mm -hmm. up. And say, oh, yeah, this is how you do it. So uh, it, it, I it's a big think, advantage. Yeah, no, I definitely think that's a strength. And I don't know if it's similar for, for you guys in, in Bridgeport or for you, in Stoughton. Like, I feel like on the on the career side, we have less and less people that are in the trades. So, like, Oh, absolutely. I, uh, I, I'm... You know, I consider myself probably the bottom third of the, you know, mechanically inclined crowd. Uh, I was the guy that I, one thing I championed in Bridgeport was the plus or minus screwdriver. Uh, you know, so they get me a yeah. screwdriver. Okay, you want plus <laughs> or minus. And, and these new members come in and I'm looking like Bob Vila compared to them. And it's, it's yeah. sad. You know, uh, I, I've, you know, I've talked to some of the other towns. I know some of the towns, even in the academies, they, they just have them screw, uh, you know, screws in the wood and nail, you know, hammers, and nails just to get them some tool time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have, uh, I have a couple of properties that I've had to do a lot of rehab to over the years. So everything that I've learned has been just by hacking it together myself. So I wouldn't call myself <laughs> a tradesman by any means, but you know, getting your hands on tools and things like that on a semi, you know, whatever daily or weekly basis, it makes a huge difference just when you see, you know, how people even just like swinging an ax or swinging an ads or a any kind of tool. If, if you, if you haven't really done it, you know, the hand eye coordination to, to do all that stuff. I mean, you, you need reps and that's what we constantly talk about here is like getting reps, you know, swing, swinging. I mean, even at, at Stoughton, we have a tire. And, you know, every, we were doing, um, it was like once a year, we just did this whole round of, it was like, you know, just getting your, it was every six months, you get your mask on, you do a bunch of tasks. And one of them was just to sit there and beat a tire with an ax and, you know, get your swings in and, right. uh, just simple things like that. It's, you know, it's huge. And there are not a lot of people growing up chopping wood and, you yeah, know, no, banging it's, nails. It's, I, you know, we, uh, you know, last year we did a, uh, a, you know, a couple of days of shoring where we just did like basic, you know, double T shores, like a car drives into a porch type scenario. Mm -hmm. And like, I was like, we were kind of laughing with, I was laughing with one of the older members. He's a machinist. So the guy's mm -hmm. like, you know, he, uh, I, I said, Oh God, like I, I had to show the guys how to use a nail gun and a palm nailer. Cause they didn't know. And I'm like, and I'm showing them, you know, right. It's like, I'm, you know, like shouldn't probably be showing them, but it, it's <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. that's the, that's the world we live in that they're right. The, right. The generation now. And it's, I hate to say it, we're kind of the last group, like our dad would change his own oil. So we would watch him, right? you know, or we would, right. We would hold the flashlight, which was probably one of the most stressful things any of us ever did in our lives. <laughs> yeah. was holding the flashlight for their father. Right? Holding it wrong. And, and, right. You know, so it, it, that, that age is gone. Everything is, is subbed out. Everything is, you know, no, no the, the DIYer isn't a thing anymore, you know, in yeah. a lot of places. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. We did a, yeah. uh, we did a roof last week at my buddy's, two weeks ago at my buddy's mom's house and uh we just thought it was just like an old school thing like everybody showed up and helped you know yeah and it was yeah. one of the it was one of the coolest things you know and it was like i talked to guys the older guys like oh we all used to do this everybody everybody got a roof for free labor you know things like right, that right 
I mean, this was a, you know, single story walkable roof. So there wasn't, you know, there wasn't too much <laughs> danger involved, but you know, between like three, four or five of us, we got the roof done in probably four or five days. And it was, uh, just to be up working, doing that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It, it, it feels good. And right. you know, oh, yeah, you, you walk, you're walking on a roof, you're getting familiar with stuff, you, you know, you're building, you don't really know it, but you're getting equity while you do that. Right. You know? right. I think we've lost in general. Um, like the, like at the end of the day, when you work hard and you feel it, you feel good. Like the, the value of yeah. sweat equity and just being up there shooting the shit with your friends and probably fucking up a couple of them. Lord knows I'm <laughs> John would tell yeah. me to hit, you know, fucking put this nail here. And I'd be like, John, you said over here. Right. And he's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, it's again, it's a different generation. And that's those are yeah. some of the, the difficulties you have uh, is trying to adapt to that. You know, the, the the I hate to say the me generation, but the younger when we were young, you did this. OK, we'll do it. Now you do this and it's well, why? Why am I doing that? You know, why? Why? You know, and, and you get a lot of that. You you, you see that yeah. in, in the instant gratification of things. Uh so in in the, the storms, one of the unique things about Derby is that the fire department puts out fires and the ambulance corps handles all the technical rescue. So the, they're, they're two, yeah, they're two separate organizations. The ambulance it handles hazmat technical rescue. Um, so when you first joined the ambulance corps, you know, it was like, okay, you had to ride the meat wagon for a couple of years mm -hmm. and then yeah. you'd started learning the rescue stuff. And uh, you know, like if it, it, dumb things like helmet fronts, you know, you, you had to wait a few years to, you got the okay to put the blue helmet front on. Yeah. You know, nowadays the kids come in and they're like, well, wait, why can't I have the blue one? You know, I want the blue one, the rescue one. Well, you, you don't, you didn't earn it yet. Right. You know, it, yeah. And it, it's, it's things like that, that you deal with. And, uh, you know, the other side of a volunteer fire department that a lot of people don't realize is the human resources side, because there, there really is no delineation between, you know, there's a paycheck and there's payroll and we don't have that. But, you know, the the issue between people, the issue with outside issues, you know, the complaints you're getting about people the the you know, you're dealing with all of that, too. And I, I don't think, you know, a lot of people realize that that side of it, uh, you know, obviously, like any fire department, any fire chief, you're dealing with administrative issues the overwhelming majority of the time. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's dumb stuff who got arrested, who got in trouble, who got into a fight with somebody who, you know, yeah. uh, and then it's, it's the, you know, there was a call and somebody yelled at the person driving by and it's the, you know, the mayor's nephew and he calls the mayor. Now the mayor's on the phone with you, but you know, all these guys were rude and, and, yeah. you know, it is a lot of that stuff. And then the other thing that a lot of people, uh, you know, the volunteer officer side is the officer duties, you know, the, the, the record keeping, the administrative side of running a fire department, the budgeting. Uh, you know, the, the uh, in my tenure as chief, I had three different fire commissioners and they the three of them had different approaches. One of them was completely, you know, hands off on, on stuff. And like we were doing budget presentations and, and uh, capital expenditure plans and, and things like that. He wanted it all to come from us. He would he would bring it to the city and present it. And, uh, you know, it, it just it, it was a full time job. I, I mean, you know. God bless my wife and my kids for putting up with it. And, uh, you know, none of it's planned. It's, it's this beautiful Saturday. We're going to go in the pool all day in the summer and the tone goes in and you're out the door. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, and I, I, you know, so, so by charter, you can only do, uh, it's a term of eight years. You come in as an assistant chief and then you work your way up to head chief. Uh, and then you're about, you you literally go from fire chief to firefighter in, in the click of a clock. Wow. And, um, it, it's like, obviously, I, I miss the calls. I miss the members. I miss some of the the public stuff uh, we do. You know, we were fortunate enough after 9-11 to get uh, a piece of the Trade Center. And we made a nice memorial on our, we have the typical New England town green, you know, yeah. and the, the monuments are from the Civil War and from, you know, all the wars. And uh, we were able to get a piece of the Trade Center. And we built a nice monument. So every year on September 11th, we have a, a, a nice ceremony. Uh, to commemorate the, the lives lost. And, and, you know, that was always something that I, I took a lot of pride in doing. Uh, you know, there's all the, the fun stuff being fire chief, right? You get to go to the, you know, you get to go to the Boy Scouts, you get to go to the meetings, you get to go to the, the public relations events. Uh, you know, the oddities. We we had uh, Harry Connick Jr. come to town and film a, a music Oh, cool. Video. Nice. And, uh, he, yeah, he, he kind of wanted to do it on the QT. So it was me and a, a Firewatch crew to, to do it while they filmed uh, and uh, what was the, the ghost hunting show, Taps, that was used to be on? 
you know, really? they came to town to film an episode and they, you know, we had to have a fire watch at the building. So, it, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff that you miss, but God, I, I, I don't miss the phone ringing constantly. Yeah. I don't blame you for that. Yeah. It's, it's funny because I ended my term by, by, you know, I, you just been fire chief for eight years. What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disney world. And, uh, <laughs> and as you know, shameless plug, as we've talked, I do a Disney podcast and uh, I'm a big Disney fan. You can see the, yeah. the clock in the background. has got the Mickey heads on it. Yep. And, uh, you know, I went to Disney and I laughed because I, whenever I would go on vacation, I'd have to bring like the spare batteries for my phone because I'd be on my phone so much during the day it would die. Oh, and yeah. like we went away and like by day three, I was like, God, my phone hasn't died once. I'm like, you know what? No one's calling me. Yeah. And, uh, and it is, it's, it's, you know, you're running, uh, uh, you know, you're running a, a hundred employee city department and it's, it's maintenance issues. It's, it's stuff breaking. It's, you know, again, it's personnel issues, it's it's city hall questions, uh, things like that. So, uh, and in the smaller communities, it all goes right to the fire chief. You know, I I I was, you know, we, we got put in charge of handing out the COVID test kits. The fire department did, you know, like, because they, again, you know, you need to get 20 people somewhere to do something. Who do you call? Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it's just a lot of different things that I just, you know, Never thought of, I guess you could say. I mean, in the pandemic, we could do a whole other podcast on what that was like for the volunteer fire service because that hurt. You know, the, the 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 allure of the volunteer fire service is a place to hang out, is the camaraderie of being there. Yep. And it's like we were trying to purposely keep people away. I think that was a – I think that turned into a scar on, you know, and everybody's – hard for their job in a sense yeah, where you know, everything because, changed and it sucks for a long time. And, you know, but we, we didn't get together. We stopped training, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and, and, you know, we had the, the, the rules from the state. You couldn't have so many people, you know, right. together. You couldn't. Right. So we, we were doing a lot of, you know, virtual training, small yeah. group training, but we weren't right. doing, you know, nearly what we wanted to. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, it's, I think that did affect us. I mean, it, it, we, you know, fortunately we, we, came through it. Okay. You know, we had a few members, you know, nobody got it, thankfully okay. that we know of from, from mm -hmm. interacting with anybody, but. So you know, what is, lot. so you went, so you went from chief and then yep. they, and then you get demoted right back down to firefighter. Right back to fire. It was great. No, <laughs> like it, you don't go to captain or Lieutenant nope. or you nothing. Go right really. to firefighter. No, so, yeah, it, <laughs> man, that must, that must just be like, you must just be looking up at the next guy being like, enjoy it. Right. You know. It is uh, for, you know, so chief Claude, Mike Claude, he's a tremendous guy, great gentleman. You know, he's good. He, he, we did a lot of good together. And, uh, you know, it's funny because like I, about a week or two after I was in there, there was a problem and somebody called me first and I, you know, I, I just to call him and be like, you know, kind of like that chuckle of Haha, yeah. that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. Right. Uh, be careful what you, you ask know. for. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, but again, like I said, you miss it. I mean, I yeah. obviously missed the, the, the fun stuff, you know, yeah. I think that's what we yeah. all would. Can you, That's cool. can you ever go back or is that? Oh, like absolutely. If you, if I wanted to, I could, you know, start the cycle over. Uh, okay. I'd probably, you know, it'd be like, Hey, I'm going to be fire chief on Monday. And on Tuesday I'll be in the lawyer's office signing my divorce papers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. So, but I, That's I, cool. uh, yeah, it's, so I became a Lieutenant in the, the fire department in, in 2003. So I had a 20 year run of Lieutenant captain, uh, then on the ambulance corps side, I became the assistant chief and the chief of the ambulance corps. But since our ambulance corps handles all, you know, the rescue work, you're you're running all that stuff. And then from there, I went to assistant chief. So it's the the first time in 20 years uh, that I have you know no no white shield, no uh, white helmet, nothing like that. It's just so, uh, so you, you just get to go do all the fun stuff again, right? It's actually you know we've had a couple yeah. jobs since in the yeah. beginning of the year, and it's fun to get there and just go. Yeah, right. Um, but That's it's. Awesome. You know, I, I take a lot of pride in the Derby Fire Department, and it's because it's of where it got all of us. And I, I mean right. all of us because, like, I have a circle of friends, you know. Uh, so my first career job, I was a fireman at the Naval Air Base in South Weymouth, Massachusetts. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Close to, yeah. Close to your home. Uh, Very that close. lasted right around a year, and then the base closed. And that's how yeah. I got the job because the base was closing. It's all so apartment buildings now. Yeah, I, I haven't been by it, and it's been years yeah. since I've been up there. But uh, you, you know, yeah. uh, about about four years ago, I think it was about four years ago now, because it was right when I got on. I've been on for five years uh, when they were building all those apartment complexes. Uh, there was uh, some speculation as to how the fire started and why it started, but uh, they had a fully built, ready to be occupied 
was waiting on like an occupancy permit or something and uh, it burned to the ground. I mean, it was probably like a, I don't know, I don't know how many units are in the buildings, but call it anywhere from like 40 to 100 or something, massive buildings. And the thing burned right to the ground. Right to the ground, yeah. And so oh, yeah, I, uh, I was going to say, so we, we sent all our resources that way because it was such a huge fire. And then what happens in Stoughton? I guess a fire broke out in Stoughton. We didn't have anybody around. <laughs> and so it's just like, go figure. We get, you know, whatever, 10, 10 real fires a year or something, like big fires. And it happens that, you know, that massive building burns down and then we get another Right, one. you're out of town. <laughs> It was like unbelievable. I wasn't there for it, but uh, you know, just listening to the stories about it, it's interesting. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. And I, so I, I said I worked there for a year, and then they, you know, the, the base closed, uh, and then I, you know, did the the I hate to say I worked the trenches, did the ambulance thing, the dispatcher thing, uh, and then in, in 07, I got hired in Bridgeport, and that you know, it's a city, it's it's bigger, it's uh, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's a lot more challenging. Uh, you know, tremendous group of members. Uh, I like, like all of us, right. We enjoy going to work every day. Um, and that's, it's, it's a lot of fun, but the, like I said, the group of us, uh, so, you know, I'm here, my, my brother's a deputy in Greenwich, you know, there's guys in, in New Haven, guys in, uh, Stratford, you know, uh, Norwalk fire, Milford fire, like West Hartford fire. And most of us are all officers by now, you know, and we all, we all started at the storms as, you know, volunteers mm -hmm. in, uh, and, and our, you know, neighborhood firehouse. Wow. So from, uh, from South, South Weymouth, where, did, when the Naval Air Station closed, where did you go from there? I, 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 you know, I did some time in the trenches working in an ambulance and dispatching. Oh, okay. Uh, right. you okay. Know, yeah. So <laughs> like everybody, right. Trying to get on the job. Yeah. So, so what's so as far as Bridgeport goes, what's the what's the demographics of that? Uh, it's a it's, it's the biggest city in the state of Connecticut. The population's around okay. one hundred and fifty thousand, about twenty okay. square miles. Uh, we're we're sixty two a shift, two battalions. Wow. Um, you know, it's it's two battalions, nine engines, four trucks, a, a rescue, and then a, a, a dedicated safety officer uh, make up the shift. So, um, you know, I I like I said, it's in Connecticut. It's the biggest city. Uh, you get out of Connecticut, you you know, you move around. It's 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 an average size city. Yeah. So, but that's still that's uh, sixty two on a shift. That's that's pretty incredible. That's yeah, a lot. yeah, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's you know that's my uh, whole each, entire fire department. Yeah, each uh, each you know the engines are four. Theoretically, on paper, the trucks are five, but the 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 first person to get pulled is the you know the fifth guy in the truck mm -hmm. to go work somewhere else. The rescue is five. The battalions are a chief and an aide. And, uh, in the seat and I'm the safety officer. And that's kind of what led me, you know, down the path of the whole volunteer command thing. Yeah. And you go to a fire at work and, and there's a command staff, you know, there's, there's the, the, you know, the battalion chief, the battalion chief has an aide, you get the members of the training division that come, you get chiefs, the other staff chiefs showing up. And then like, I go home and you go to a fire in, in the Valley and it's the same fire, right? It's a two and a half yeah. wood. It's a three wood. It's a multifamily. And I, I, you know, we all have pet peeves, but I'll say it. You have the volunteer fire chief standing on the front lawn in a turnout coat and a pair of jeans holding the portable. And it's like, well, well, why is it that, you know, when, we, when we're here at work, you, you have a command staff helping the incident commander. And then you go to a volunteer department and you, you got the guy by himself trying to, to organize this whole thing. And, yeah. and that's kind of where we, uh, we started the, the idea of, of, of upping our officer training, you know, in the, you know, the other thing, too, is how much officer development do you really do, especially on the volunteer side? Because the volunteer officers have to handle the training of the firefighters and, and like any department there. But there's no training division. Right. The individual right. company officers, they handle their 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 training. Yeah. So we it was one thing we did heavily. We we started bringing in uh, officer speakers. I did classes specifically for officers. I would try to find um you know, some of the, the, you know, uh, Rich Doe, he's the fire chief now in Danbury. He was the fire chief in Bridgeport, but he was a volunteer the whole time too. So, yeah. you know, he, his experience level on both sides was there. So bring him in to, to do some training and to do, to, to, uh, teach. And, um, we brought in some, some people from out of state. We did like weekend long incident command classes. And I, I just thought it, it's a huge, like part of the fire service that the volunteer side was missing was this, you know, we're, we're training the members, but nobody's training us. 
Right. And yeah. and the other side of it too is now that I'm in this position, at the time I wasn't, you kind of threw away the old fire chiefs. And I, I thought that was kind of idiotic in a way. Um, here's a guy who serves eight years doing this and, and built up a wealth of knowledge and experience running a fire. And then the next day he's a firefighter and you don't rely on that. Mm-hmm. And, and then in another asset of the volunteer fire service, I hate to say, are the older members that uh, I always use my father as an example. You know, my father joined the fire department in, the, in 1974. He, uh, he, you know, he was a company officer. He was chief of our ambulance corps. His full-time position, he was a police sergeant. So he had a lot of leadership experience. And now when he comes to a fire, he stands across the street, takes some pictures and watches. And it's like, put that to use, put those members in, you know, have him run your command post, have him run your command board uh, and, and allow the, you know, the, the biggest thing that I learned over the years about being a fire chief is that when there's a fire, the fire chief must focus 100% on the members and what they're doing. And, you know, you can't do that when you're worried about re- arranging mutual aid coverage of your firehouse or, hey, is Red Cross coming? Or, you're you know, right. everybody wants to talk to the fire chief at a call. Everybody. Mm-hmm. So every civilian, every politician, every reporter is, is you know, coming up to you. Ha- have these members run your command post. Have them be your, you know, so that you could focus on the members so that, God forbid, if something goes wrong, um, you're, you have the ability to, to respond and, and deploy everybody and handle it. And, and we learned that lesson down here the hard way. Uh, you know, in July of, of 2010, I was involved in the double line of duty in Bridgeport. And one of the key factors was at the time, you know, the incident commander handled the radio traffic on both radios. So our incident commander would be out front with two portables handling fire ground and, you know, dispatch communications. And, and the, a mayday was missed, you know, blatantly missed. Uh, so it, it's just, again, something in the volunteer side we don't think about a lot and we don't. You know, I'm not saying we don't think about maydays. We do a lot of, you know, mayday training, but the incident commander is is being you know, like I, very early on. You went to a call and you're trying to talk to the guys in the building, and the dispatcher's calling you. Hey, do you want to tone for more man, uh, more apparatus? Do you want to tone for more manpower? Do you want me to move an orange engine to cover your firehouse? Like what? And it's like I I, I don't I don't want to talk to you. I don't I don't need to hear that. Let somebody else handle it. They're essentially task task saturated. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so. After- through that line, is that where the, where the birth of the safety officers came for you in Bridgeport? Yes, that that's after? yeah. So at, prior to that, the safety officers were working out of our training division, and they basically they worked nine to five, and then they went home at nights and weekends. And one of them was on call, and if there was a, a you know confirmed fire, they would come in. Um, and that the uh, you know the Elmwood Ave fire was a uh, it was a Saturday afternoon job, so the the you know the safety officer came in off duty, took him a little bit of time to get there. And that was one of the things in the, uh, in the, you know, the NIOSH report they cited was we didn't, the, sa- the, the lateness of the safety officer arriving on scene and, and beginning safety responsibilities. So we were able to get a, 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 you know, a safety officer on shift. So what, what is the typical, like, so say you're, you're working tomorrow and they strike a box for a work and fire. What is, what is your, uh, responsibilities on scene look like? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's nice. I, I have, you know, thankfully I have two good battalion chiefs and I, I have a great working relationship with both of them. So uh, basically arrive on scene, you know, I'll do a 360 and then I'll go do a face to face with the chief. Uh, you know, tell him, you know, what, what did I see? Did, you know, did, did any concerns, anything like that? Uh, then I'll tell him, I, usually I go right to the first line. Um, I want to, I want to get right up to that first line to, to get a look at conditions inside. Cause uh, you know, a lot of philosophies on safety officers. You know, there's the whole don't ever, you know, like there's safety officers that'll say, well, you should never be in the building. You know, and my answer back to them has always been how many people are outside watching the outside? You know, think about it. How many people are at a fire looking at the building, watching, you know, pretty much everybody outside, whether they, they, they realize it or not. Uh, I like to find the first line to see, you know, talk to the officer. Hey, are, are conditions improving? You know, how, how's, how's it going? Or, you know, I get there and tell them, hey, it's it's chugging out the door you came in. Was it like that when you got here? You know, no, it wasn't that bad. All right, you know, we're not making progress. We're not. So usually it's a, it's a you know, a, a, a go in to that, to that first entry point and, and monitor conditions, talk to the first officers, uh, then come back out. Uh, you know, we have some rehab duties as the safety officer. We're supposed to set up rehab. Uh, fortunately, I could usually talk to the AMR, the ambulance crew. You know, hey, do me a favor, go get the coolers. You know, we're glorified yeah. barbacks in a way. 
Yeah. Um, also <laughs> part of our job. But, uh, you know, and then it's just monitoring conditions, you know, l- listening to the radio, listening to, you know, you're, you're listening to the radio traffic to see if, if anyone's having a problem where they are. Obviously, Viber alerts, um, you know, and, and kind of things like that. I'll usually kind of find a way, spot to position myself again, you know, near a door. Uh, clearing stairwells is a pet peeve of mine. You know, uh, I'll, I'll throw this. I always say throw the. We always used to joke that I wanted to carry a flag like an NFL referee. Yeah. Throw the safety flag, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, cl- clearing stairwells is one of them. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a gear police guy. I feel that a lot of people think when they're the safety officer, you know, you're there to monitor for gloves and hoods. Uh, they, they have company officers for that. And, uh, you know, you, you should be a little bit bigger. At, you know, at a working fireman, obviously, if you see someone doing something dumb and stupid, you're going to intervene. But yeah. there's a, you know, I, I think, I think the other issue is there's so few of us that are dedicated, you know, safety officers. It's usually like, uh, again, it's somebody's secondary responsibility. Um, yeah. That you don't have the, it's, it's, you know, in the fire service, how many years we've been stretching hose, you know what the nozzle firefighter has to do. You know, how many years have we had a safety officer, especially just dedicated ones? You're kind of making it up a little bit as you go. Um, yeah. You know, and, and there's, there's you know, there's four of us. We're on shift. We, we have four, you know, real good. It's me, Billy, Josh, and Scott. Um, you know, we, we have a good rapport with each other. We we, we talk a lot. You know, we're, we're on the same page with a lot of things. Um, you know, there's, a, there's things that we each, you know, we each have our strengths and weaknesses. Um, I never put fuel in the car, so Josh always has to come in and put gas in. That's usually, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but we all have our. <laughs> I didn't fuel my ambulance our, up last night, so. Yeah, you know, we all have yeah. our uh, our things. Usually after I work, there's like a McDonald's wrapper or two somewhere in the car to get some fries <laughs> out. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we all have our pros and cons of, of what we're good at. And, and fortunately, we all complement each other very well. Uh, Billy's kind of like the dad of the group. Uh, we're, you know, we're all lieutenants, too, so it's it's. Yeah. There's, you know, the, the four of us are all same rank. Uh, Billy kind of ha- maintains the order. You know, Josh is very good with the, the he handles like the supply ordering, the, um, you know, the things like that. Scott is good with the engine company, truck company stuff. Uh, you know, we, we all, so we all kind of have our strengths that we all play off of. We know who to, to go to for what. And it, it's a good, you know, there's four of us. So it makes it kind of fun. Uh, the downside is you're a company officer, but you don't have a company. You yeah. know, like some days you miss, some days you miss the fire truck. Some days you miss right. having, you know, it's a couple of people sitting behind you that you can talk to. Hey, but the flip side, you're by yourself. You can do whatever you want. You can go to any firehouse. You kind of, you know, your typical day is you come in, you, you, you know, print out the rosters, go over to the, the training division and meet with them to, to go over what training is for the day, what you got to deliver. But you're kind of, it, it's, you're kind of on your own. Um, yeah. And I always joke, I say, right, my position as safety officer I'm there to prevent people from freelancing and working on their own. And I do that by freelancing and working on my own. And, oh, yeah, you, know, that's, that's you know, so it, it is, it's, irony. it's a unique job. Uh, it's a unique position within the department, especially since we're one of the, you know, the few that that's our, our whole day. You know, yeah. usually they share, you know, you're sharing responsibilities doing something else. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're like when you had told me you were safety out, I think you're the first department that at least, I mean, I'm definitely not the end all be all, but that has a dedicated safety officer. So usually like once we get to a certain level, you know, beyond a work and fire, second alarm, like one of the incoming chiefs will assume the role of a safety officer, but having a, a dedicated staffed safety officer role, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I enjoy it. I, uh, luckily, you know, I was luckily, you know, I, I actually kind of, I don't want to say I backed into it, but uh, I have a unique skill in the Bridgeport Fire Department that a lot of people don't have. I'm an EMS instructor. And amazingly, mm-hmm. since we're still an old, uh, like, you know, New England town, we're all we're only EMRs. We're not even EMTs. Uh, so EMS, as much as it makes up a huge percentage of our call volume, culturally speaking, you know, it, it, it's still lagging a little bit. Um, but it, I, I was so it was natural for me to move into that position because I could help facilitate stuff as the, as an EMS instructor. I was one of, at the time, I think there was only, when I first went to the car, there was only two of us in the department. Now that they bolstered it up, obviously. And, and, but yeah, it's an interesting spot, especially when you, yeah. you go around and you see it, not, not a lot of people have it. Yeah. So. I, yeah. So we don't, have don't, our don't, safety don't. officer as our captain of training and safety. And so he takes okay. care of our training throughout the week, you know, shift by shift. And his is a, just considered a day staff position. 
So he lives in town so he can make it to most fires. And I would say that he has. And when he gets on scene, that's his job every time is to be the captain of safety. And so, I mean, he does a really good job, but there are times when he's away that, you know, if we catch a fire, no one's really assuming, no one's really, I don't know if anyone's really assuming that role. So that's kind of how it works for us. Yeah, it was one of the uh, one of the things that you know we were able to get instituted here in Derby was a, a safety officer, right? Um, and it was it was funny because you talk about like the politics of a volunteer fire department. The city charter in is you know the, the town is run by a city charter, and mm-hmm. it spells out the officers of the fire department. And when we tried to add the safety officer, we actually ran into issues with the city because it would take a, a change of the city charter. Okay. So like technically, the safety officer is a. Uh, it's like weird. We had to like make a roundabout. We couldn't call it a chief because <laughs> the charter spelled out. So even though it walks like a duck and talks like a duck on paper, yeah, it's like, yeah. the, you know, like, yeah, one of those situations. But, okay. Uh, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. We were able to, to put that in. So, so uh, there's, you know, the, besides the four chiefs and the commissioner, there's a, a safety officer for the department too. So. Interesting. So when I, I know we kind of talked about like the nexus of you realizing that there was a gap with uh, like, uh, incident command board presence in volunteer fire departments. When did you really take off with that? Like when did, when did that story start? Uh, oh, very recently, only within the past couple of years, you know, we, we, we provided the training on a lot of things, but I didn't start developing the program. To be honest, I kind of got bullied into it. Um, you know, the, the uh, one of my friends who, who really thought I was onto something with the program, uh, you know, actually say one of them, there was three of them, chief Thode, uh, captain Esposito, and then Mike Wittick. They were like, dude, you're, you really should like do something with that. You're onto something, you know, you're, you're hundred percent right. So I, I put together a program and submitted to the, uh, fire EMS pro expo to, to come and present. And, uh, you know, luckily enough, I got picked. So I went and presented at the, at the expo. And then from there, you know, I started getting departments calling to, to ask me to come, you know, give the lecture to them. Nice. Uh, so, it, you know, yeah, it, it's that way, you know, uh, that, you know, the way that it goes, right. You're, you're, you know, you're out there pounding the pavement going and trying to, 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 to yeah. book classes and to teach and, and, you know, a lot of good conversation with, uh, with people in, um, in, in some of the departments that I've gone to already and, and talked and, you know, our discussions, they're just, they, you know, it's eye opening that they, they're like, you know, we never thought of that. You know, you're right. We're, we're focused on the training of the members, but not the officers. We're, we're letting right. the chief, you know, get past saturated, uh, and, and we're, we're not helping them. And there's 10 people watching the fire that used to be officers that used to be, that could jump in on roles and, uh, you know, and, and take some of that burden off the chief. Yeah. So, and, and we'll definitely put your, put your contact info in there for, I mean, I mean, I hope a lot of people watch the show, but like, <laughs> it depends on the day probably. Uh, but yeah. we'll put your contact info and you, ha- you have the Instagram as well. Did that start at Correct. the same time? Yeah, I started that kind of the same time, the Instagram. Um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, I try to, you know, throw a couple of posts up there, uh, you know, here and there, just talking about different. It, it's just, I, you know, I've been told by a few people that I took the role uh, a little too serious in that, you know, um, it's, you know, you're, you're a volunteer fire chief, but again, you know, I, I tell people I've been the fires in the biggest and the smallest city in the state and there's no difference. Nobody's no stopping difference. and saying, Hey, yep. take a break on those guys. Cause they're volunteers. Exactly. And, and, you know, and, and I do take it seriously because I hate to say it. I, I've been there when it goes bad and I, I never want anyone to have to go through that and, and deal with that. And, it, and knowing that you could you could have put systems in place to to you know to prevent the Swiss cheese from lining all the holes up, yeah. Uh, it it really it, it's an easy way to to kind of progress everyone forward. Yeah. No, I mean I, I think it is important and it's something that we I mean I think it's over over seventy percent of this country is, is volunteer combination departments call volunteer, and I I always used to tell people like. You know, in getting on Cambridge, which is about pretty much the same size as Bridgeport, a little less. We're sitting at like 310, 300 to 310, I think, with like administrative staff. But like line suppression is like a, roughly at like 285, I think. Um, like if we get a fire in one, in one part of the city, right, you might not like some of the engine companies, some of the truck companies, if it, if it doesn't get beyond like a working fire or second alarm, you might not go. Um, 
in a lot of these these volunteer departments like there's there's no district like you go like you're right, if right. you're available you respond so mm-hmm. you know i i've never been on board with that like oh like career superior because a lot of times one like you said you know these volunteers it's not like the fire behavior is any different or any less deadly and a lot of times if, if there is a fire they're all going versus you know I remember being on my first initial company that didn't have a good run card. I'd be sitting, pacing around the station, listening to guys get to work. Right. Yeah, and that, and that is, you know, it's funny. That's one thing I wasn't mentally prepared for when I got out of Bridgeport was the thought that there was going to be fires that in the town while you're there and you're not going to go. Yeah, yeah that's like, got to be like, tough. You're, you're pacing the watch. You're like, are you that's got to be you tough. Know? Yeah, uh, but it 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 kind of, you know, around here too. It started it started working in a way that I didn't expect with the, uh, the, the officer training and the chief stuff, because now, you know, during the day right now, if there was a fire in the neighboring town or a town or two away, I would, you'd go buff, right? I mean, you got nothing to do. The kids are at school. And I, uh, you know, again, another, we started, instead of buffing, we started kind of getting involved with each other. And, and, you know, you'd walk up to the command post and be like, Hey, you need it. You need me to, what do you mean to do? And I, it, it led me, you know, a couple of times over sometimes just showing up and, you know, standing in the background, I I had one of the chiefs turn around, and look at me, and go, "Are are you here? Can you help?" I said, "Yeah, what's up?" He says, "I'm the only officer here," and he's looking at you know a, a four brick in downtown wow. connected on you know three sides going, and he's like, I, "I'm the only company, I'm the only officer here. I need help." Okay, no problem. Give me a radio. And, uh, yeah, and it, and it started that you know, the, and that's the biggest issue we have in this area is the radios. Uh, oh yeah. So what do you, you know, mean by the biggest ass- issue? So Derby and Ansonia used to be back in the, you know, hundreds of years ago, this whole area used to be Derby and, and they, the towns kind of broke off. But mm-hmm. Derby and Ansonia, the town lines mend so much. You you don't know which town you're in on some streets. You know, there are people that, that have no idea which, but we're completely different radio frequencies. Okay. So, you know, we, we physically can't talk to them. I mean, thankfully, technology, you know, all the company officers, the chiefs carry multi-band radios now. Um, and the, each, you know, uh, engine has a multi one multi-band radio, but you still have that problem where the firefighters can't talk. Right. Uh, you know, we, we, the chiefs can talk, but the, you get down to the street level, you know, they're on two different frequencies, two different systems. Okay. Uh, and that's been a big priority. We've been, you know, we were pushing for the state to kind of get us some, some money. We would gladly all switch to one radio system. And I think right. that's going to be the catalyst that'll create, if you will, the regional department. Uh, on pay, you know, again, we act like it now. I mean, we keep our own identities, we keep our own, but I think once we get a common radio system and now you can start erasing districts and lines because, you know, I mean, right now where I sit in my house in Derby, the closest firehouse to me is, is a couple hundred yards away. It's in Ansonia. And okay. if we had a, you know, if my house is on fire, you're going to have that delay of, you know, the 911 going to Derby, then to the, our dispatcher, then they have to put the tone in for Ansonia. And it, you know, but if you switch to a regional dis or a, a, a common radio system, that'll go away. And, right. and yeah. you know, I think that'll be the catalyst that finally creates the uh, the, the the regional department. Right. Yeah. And you, you see that a lot down south. So when I was I was stationed in Fort Bliss, Texas, in El Paso, and outside of other, obviously there's the El Paso City Fire Department, but outside of that, they use what's called ESDs, Emergency Services Districts, or it's like a county based system. So all these smaller towns that either didn't have like the personnel or the funding to have their own like competent and trained fire department, those three or four towns would come together to fund, you know, obviously, you know, uh, tax, you know, uh, t- having a tax base to actually fund, you know, good training and good equipment, having the personnel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and one of the things, you know, when we were talking earlier about like, you know, what it, what is the answer for, for volunteer and call departments? And like a lot of people say, they're like, I, I don't have a good answer and it's not being pessimistic right. but i think like you said um whether that ends up being transitioning to combining resources into a more regional based response i, I think it's, uh go ahead it's Dave. a big problem that, that no one has a solid answer for because the answer is you got to pay people right you know you're you're asking people for such a big time commitment they're going to have to be compensated right you know and that's that's the only way you know, unfortunately, the days of somebody working in a shop or a, a mill, you know, in the town and then a call comes in and their boss is like, yeah, go ahead. You can leave and come back. They're gone. Right. And and it's just that's that was the heart and soul of the volunteer fire service were those mm-hmm. types of members that, right. you know, worked in your town, worked at a place where they were able to come and go. And um, it's gone. You know, times yeah. have changed. Yeah. I think economically speaking, like you said, paying people, but. 
I've like looked at some people like put numbers together and, you know, it was like, you know, 40 years ago, you could have a, a job where you work 40 hours, afford a house and a car, you know, and, a you know, go spend a couple weeks a year on a nice vacation somewhere. Everybody's crunched for time because everybody's crunched for money. So nobody can do anything for free. It's hard to get anyone to volunteer to do anything. It's hard to organize anything because everybody's been, a lot of guys that I work with all have two jobs. I'm actually on the brink now where I'm like, <laughs> I really need to get a second job, but I didn't get a full-time job so that I could go get a part-time job. I got a full-time job so I could just do my job, you know? So I, I think it just breaks down to, well, one, right. We have that CYA nonsense, right? We're, we have to cover your ass for everything. So you got to check all the boxes all the time you know, for liability purposes. So when you combine liability with just like the real tough economic times, I, everybody has to spend every hour they have wisely working and making yeah. the most money they can, which is unfortunate because that completely strips away. Like I'm sitting here like fascinated by Derby because it seems like you guys, even though you're going through the same struggles, it seems like you guys are at the still at the top of the heap. You guys still have some magic left there where you have like such a good thing going, you know. Um, but, you know, it's like it's fascinating. And it's like you almost wish you could go back and live in the time when the community yeah. when the community was that strong and tight that the people were just doing that stuff, you know, because that's that's what it is. It's all just community based and caring for your neighbors and caring for people in town and caring for the place and having pride where you live. Um, and not to say people don't have that now, but it's, it's harder to just give your time away so freely, you know? Yeah. That, I said, that's, that's the biggest obstacle. It's just, yeah. you know, and you do, you get a lot of members that come in and they join. And once they, they find the time commitment, yeah, you know, they, they slowly fade away. And right. it's, it's, you know, it's sad, um, yeah. but it's, it's like you said, you're, you're, you're so regulated now that you yeah. have to, and you got to do it, you know? And that's, that was kind of like things you felt dirty about is when you were doing things because you literally knew it checked the box. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, trying to explain that to some of the, you know, especially some of the younger guys, like, look, right. you, I know you, you hate doing online training. That's my biggest pet our, peeve. From our standpoint as the chiefs, you know, when ocean knocks on the door, I yeah. think, look, we did it. You know, here's right. a, here it is. Right. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's my biggest, I, that's my biggest pet peeve. I don't care what it is. I don't want to do it online. And here's why. And I understand that it's 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 like as far as time goes, you can do it in your off time or whatever, you can just fit it in. But every time we do an online training, it gives me a reason to take my laptop, go to my room or wherever in the firehouse, sit there by myself and go through this training while everybody else is kind of doing the same thing at one point or another. And it takes away from everybody having to be in the same room, getting your hands on something. And having the person who's actually who is actually um, responsible for the information to hand it down to you in a way that they're teaching you, and that's why it's my biggest pet beef because it just takes away from even if it's not like training per se, it's just going over and reviewing something or whatever. Um, it's like you just miss that opportunity to put your hands on it or to actually listen to the person who has something valid to say to you. So you miss the opportunity for the conversation with, with, with the guys at work, guys and gals at work, I should say. So that's why it's yes. my big pet peeve, but I can see why for like the chief's position, you're like, yeah, we're going to do this. I get it. So I, I was it last spring, you know, OSHA, they, uh, they, they popped into town to do a routine inspection. Mm -hmm. And we, over the pandemic, we did online, we did a lot of online training. You know, we had money for it. They were giving us money to do it. Sure. So we we were using one of the online platforms, and and I can tell you, there were guys I know. They, I mean, I hated doing it as much as they hated doing it. But yep. You know, it, last year OSHA came in. The inspector, the lady said, you know, I need to see your your training requirements for this, this, and this. And when you printed out 185 pages and handed it to her, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. you know. <laughs> Oh, and, okay. and quietly in my mind, I'm like, it was worth it. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> but again, and and those are the things, you know, like that when you're when you're sitting at the top, you're you know, your thirty thousand foot view, you're worried about everything. Yeah, and it's like you know, yeah. I get, yeah, it. I get it's it. painful. <laughs> I know so, my my deck my deputy chief wasn't happy with me because I I had a an assignment due 
on the first, but I was at FDIC last week, which isn't an excuse. And I apologize. It said I didn't have an excuse. And it was a three minute video and I totally felt like a jerk for like not logging and doing it. But I forgot my laptop like two weeks ago at work. And that's the, that's where I have all my passwords saved. And I was like, I'll do it next week. And then I forgot. I was like, ah, but whatever. I digress. That's the way it is nowadays. Yeah. You know, yep. so, sorry, Jim. Sorry, yeah. Deb. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, you try. So I mean, I, the other thing, you know, another thing that we did a lot of was bring in outside instructors. And yeah, that's, something that's that cool. Helps, you know. I go like, here's the thing: as much as you know, my resume is this. If I'm going to get up in front of the group and teach, it's like who's going to throw a paper airplane? Yeah, we're going to start joking, you yep. know. So by bringing in outside instructors, mm-hmm. you, you know, it holds their attention a lot more. And, and fortunately, where we are here, you know, in this yeah. area, we have a lot of good. Uh, you know, good instructors, good companies, uh, guys out of the city, guys out of, you know, the bigger cities, Bridgeport, New Haven, yeah. uh, Hartford, Waterbury, we're all right in the yep. middle of those towns. And then, you know, obviously you could bring in the big guns once in a while, bring somebody in from New York. Sure. Uh, so yeah. it, it uh, you know, a, a tremendous asset we had. One of my assistant chiefs, his uncle was a safety chief in New York City. Oh, nice. And, um, you know, it was great because you could bring him in for a class and, and he uh, he would come in and, and do some teaching and, uh so it was like you know, little things like that. But if you, I always found bringing in outside instructors, definitely, you know, you, yeah. get, you get everyone's attention much more. That's a good and, point. Yeah. 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 It's more engaging. So really I remember you talking about, you know, obviously the baseline commitment, you know, when someone, when someone comes in as a volunteer firefighter, modern day volunteer firefighter, you tell them, I, I need roughly 200 hours a year to get you to where you need to be. Um, focusing on what you're, what you're passionate about of like, uh, volunteer officer development and going in the chief officer, how, what is the, what is the time commitment for like a lieutenant or a captain or, you know, obviously up for chief officer I, significant, but yeah, I mean, you, you want it to be a lot, right? Like you, you but you gotta be realistic. I mean, so, uh, between the, between the online crap, uh, the online training and then what we did in person. <laughs> We probably added around, I'd say, 24 hours a, a year of training to the officers, yeah. um, you know, and that was between, you know, again, the online stuff. We'd bring in the, the additional speakers throughout the year, additional uh, classes and stuff. I, I was trying to keep it around that number of 24. Uh, yeah. I figured it was you know, a good number, you know. Uh, and again, you 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 made the choice to be an officer. You made the commitment to do it. So you got to do it. Yeah. No, that's. I think that the bringing in people from the outside is, is, is really cool. And hopefully some people from the outside will bring you in. Right? For, for <laughs> yeah. Shameless right. plug. <laughs> yep. <that's, laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Cool. We're, we're, uh, we're not the only ones with the podcast. You want to tell us a little, a little bit about your podcast? Oh yeah. So like, like I mentioned that, you know, we all have side things, right? So I, uh, I'm, I'm a, a Disney nut. I'm one of those guys, you know, and uh, Disney Star Wars, you know, uh, it's May the Fourth as we're doing this, so yeah, May I the Fourth be with you. Star, I <laughs> take off my Star Wars apparel and, yeah. uh, and and you know put something a little bit on, but yeah, so it's called Two Dudes Talking Disney. Uh, my my buddy Tony, we've been friends since we were kids. Uh, we do a podcast, and it's it's mainly focused Disney, the, you know, the parks and things like that, and then obviously it spills into the the Disney umbrella of Star Wars, Marvel, all the other mm-hmm. you know Disney yeah. brands that are out there, so. Uh, we've been on, God, we've been on for probably six, seven years now. Um, you know, we joke, we'd say we're the most popular Disney podcast in the lower, you know, Connecticut Valley region. Um, <laughs> you know, we are the only one, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 I enjoy it. You know, I, I do enjoy getting together. I did a, uh, you know, an appearance last night on a local, uh, you know, online newspaper. They're doing a fundraiser. So I did a little, uh, I think we, we did, a half hour on the Mandalorian and uh, the status nice. of, of those sh- of Star Wars. So nice, uh, very cool. Yeah, it's my 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 side hobby. <laughs> well, I, I am a Disney kid, so so I get it. Okay. So where where can people find you? I've podcast? never been to Disneyland though. Oh, uh, Disneyland is better than Disney World. Oh, I've never really? been either. Never been yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. California is better than Florida. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll die on that hill any day of the week. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. You know, I've you never... know what it is to me as an as as an overall. Now, don't get me wrong. If you've only been to one, you cannot fathom the size of the other, right? Like so Disneyland only, is so been... small. Okay, so Disneyland fits in the parking lot of the Magic Kingdom in Florida. That's how small mm-hmm. Disneyland is. So, 
But to me, as a fan of Walt Disney himself, you know, Walt designed Disneyland. Walt set that up where, you know, Florida was built. It was built being built while he while he was alive. He died while it was being built. But Walt never stepped foot there. There's nothing Hmm. really, you know, nothing with a signature on it to it. Right. Where when you go to Disneyland, you know, it's his park. So to me, I like Disneyland better because of that. No, I'll definitely have to uh, That's check it out. So, yeah. So last year, my wife uh, and myself, we just did like a little a little getaway vacation. We only went to, I, I've been a couple of times as a kid, but we went to Animal Kingdom and we, we had a good time, but it's just to the point where you're we're waiting in line for, you know, two and a half hours for, for one ride. Do you, do you feel that like Disneyland is a little bit more like uh, efficient? Uh, it's, it's definitely smaller and it's also more of a local is, is funny as this is to say, kind of got more of a local park. You know, there's houses almost across the street from Disneyland, you know, like you could, you could walk, people walk from their house there. Uh, you know, so it's, it is, it's, it's less, it's more like local people that you get at Disneyland than you do, you know, where Disney world, everybody's, you know, coming just to go there. And to to loop it back to firefighting, I believe they had a, a flaming dragon recently, or something like that, right? Flaming dragon, yeah. The, the, you know, the funny thing is that actually the it was the phantasmic dragon. But about two years ago, they had the same thing happen in Disney World to the dragon in, in the Magic Kingdom. So, uh, and you know, I always say the reason why I'm such a fan of Walt Disney is like me, Walt lived in a firehouse. So, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of people don't realize in Disneyland, Walt had an apartment in the firehouse. Oh wow. Um, that's yeah. Cool. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's my side thing. It's my little passion uh, project. Uh, so fun, right? Get us, cool. keep, keep you. Uh... We'll, we'll definitely. Uh, so we'll, we'll put the link to obviously Volley Chief. Um, and then we'll yep. put all your con- contact info for where people can find you. And of, co- and of course, for the podcast Excellent. as well. Um, Sweet, but other you. than that, we, we really appreciate your time. Um, thanks yeah, for no, it's, I, I had a great time. Thank you. I look forward to actually meet, you know, sitting down with you guys to have a beer sometime soon, hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah, let's, well, let's make it yeah. sooner than later. Yeah. yeah. Keep, what, keep Morrissey in line, will you? You know, you got, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, that, that kid, whoo, you yeah. know, he's a, he's a good dude. I, I'd like to meet the rest of the family because yeah. I, I just, I feel bad for his parents. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, everyone talks so nice about him and what great people yeah. they are. And I'm like, God, I wonder what happened. Oh. Yeah, no, they have, uh, his dad, his dad just retired, uh, about, a, uh, maybe about a year and a half ago. He's, he's awesome. Eddie, Eddie senior, uh, his brother's a Lieutenant on ladder one. Who's again, like salt of the earth, nicest guy. Actually, Johnny, you remember Eddie Morrissey, right? From the Academy. Yeah. 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 He, he yeah. gave me a lot of hell in Academy, but funny. He's really funny. Yeah. He has, he has a lot of tact yeah. that guy. Yeah. 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 He's a good so. dude. But yeah, no, we we'll didn't, we, we didn't bond over our last name similarities. <laughs> we bonded. We bonded. We bonded over him just absolutely crapping all over me. <laughs> so, but yeah, with any luck, maybe we'll see you at the uh, at the expo too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I'm gonna be there again teaching this year. So when is that awesome. again? What's the date uh, on that? October. Okay. October. Cool. And it's near Halloween. Okay. We'll be there. Definitely putting that on good, the calendar. Good. Awesome. So, oh. all, right, all right, guys. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. All right, oh, Dave. Absolute pleasure. Pleasure is all ours. Thank you so much.